Hi, I'm Chris Chimicles, president of Angie and Group, and welcome to our Leading Litigators series. Our series brings together some of the best and brightest class action practitioners from both the plaintiffs and defense bars, and most importantly, the attorneys that made case law. Enjoy our series. Hi, I'm Steve Weisbrot. Welcome to another edition of Angie and's Leading Litigator Series. Today we have Jay Edelson, the founder and CEO of Edelson PC, and we're super excited to have him here. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Thanks so much for coming out. I was generous of you to do so. It's my pleasure. So Jay, there's been a lot of superlatives in the press thrown around about you and your firm. Some of the ones that were most interesting to me were public enemy number one, uh, and also the most hated man in Silicon Valley. Are these things that you think are accurate? Do they make you happy? Do they hurt your feelings? How do you feel about the superlatives in the press? Well, I think I've, I found out uh, the genesis of it and it actually came from my wife. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's created a lot of internal angst uh, within the family. No, seriously, um, the, I, I think that they're funny. Uh, I think that I understand the sentiment of it. Um, I, I don't think that that is, uh, that's necessarily the reality. Um, when, uh, when we actually sit down with the tech companies, even when we're suing them, they tend to hate us at the beginning um, and in the middle and uh, all the way up towards the end. But I think in the end um, that we actually have a decent relationship. Um, and I, I, you never actually see a quote from anybody who we've litigated against. Uh, who's who said that? Um, but I've I have a thick skin. I, I, I actually like the you know I've, I now have up to like eight nicknames, which I think is pretty funny. Are there any others you want to share that I haven't? Uh, did you say baby face boogeyman? And, no, and the one. international press called me the hunter in the hoodie, which uh, it was in German, and I had to have that translated. I, I thought that was funny. They're they're all they're all funny. I I feel like they're they're not necessarily descriptive of me, but they're descriptive of some character that, that they think I play. Got it. Well, that, that makes sense. Um, you have a very unique law firm in a lot of ways. One, one is your focus on sort of tech and consumer cases. Other is even the physical plant of the law firm looks like no firm that I've ever visited and I've been in my fair share of law firms. Do you want to talk a little bit about what makes your firm unique? Yeah, I, I think that um, Probably the, the fact that, that we come at everything in a, uh, a way contrary to most law firms who generally look at precedent and say, this is how everyone else is doing it, we should do it like that. We have an opposite approach. Um, in, in, uh, in Israel, the, the word is dafka, which is you, know, you, you do things almost the opposite of how everybody else is doing it. And that's not quite our approach, but we definitely approach everything from first principles. And we've been incredibly influenced. Our, the early suits that we had at the firm were against uh, tech companies. And, um, and we sued them and got to understand their business model. And I was blown away. I said, they're violating the law, but like, these, these companies are run really well, much better than law firms, much better than traditional businesses. And the people love it over there. Um, so when I started trying to figure out what I want in a law firm, um, I was really looking there. We're, we're unique as, as a law firm. We are not unique if you view us as a tech company. So what are those principles that exist in tech that apparently also exist here at Edelson? Um, what, what are they? What are the, trans, the, the, the actual um, ties that bind? So, so the, the first thing is, I won't speak for Silicon Valley, but I'll speak for, for my firm. Okay. Um, I believe that, uh, that the work people do is there's two types of work. There's energy generating work and energy depleting work. And at most law firms, 90% of the work that you do is energy depleting. And I think it makes it miserable places to work. Mm -hmm. What we said is, how do we come up with a firm where what people are doing is energy generating? And we realized we could do it in a number of ways. One is picking cases that we thought were fun. On the plaintiff's class action side, we get to pick our cases. So even if a case looks really good and we can make a lot of money on it, but it will be really boring to us, we will pass, because I want people to be excited about their job. Number two, the, the people at the firm get to decide what they want to do. Uh, there are some people who love the investigative process. They love looking at documents and understanding every little detail. That's not me. That would be energy depleting for me. So at most law firms, I would still do my share of that if I were a young associate. Here, 
we say, don't do that. We've got an investigative team. That's what they love doing. Let them do that. The people who, are, who get energized about writing briefs get to write briefs. Um, and um, and that, that is, that's a big differentiator uh, for us. It, it makes it so we're, we're a very high energy place. Um, and, uh, and I think it, it, it changes the, the experience of the attorneys here. And because of that, we're able to do better work. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I would imagine, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that a lot of the environment, the physical plant, it, it echoes off of that sort of energy. I mean, was that the thinking? The, the thinking was, um, I, I'm very motivated, not by money, but by success. And I could not feel successful if I was at a place where people weren't happy. Um, I, I'm probably the part of me that, that when they talk about me being the most feared and loathed attorney they miss. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid at heart. I'm a pretty silly guy. Uh, and so the fact that we have you know, people riding hoverboards and stuff and shooting darts at each other uh, and playing ping pong is, is a reflection of my personality. And when I see that people actually love being here, uh, that makes me happy. I feel like I've, I've achieved something, not, not just as a lawyer, but as, as someone who is able to create a law firm that's maybe a little bit different than, than other law firms. That's great. So you describe yourself as a kid at heart. There are others who would describe you as contrarian. There's certain things you've, you've said in, in public or in the, in the press. And I want to seize on a couple of them and see if you would just either, you can either address them piecemeal or just about how your general approach to, um, you know, to dealing with these things are. One is, I follow you on social media. Uh, you had gone back and forth with Ted Frank, and I believe, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, one of the things you said is that the plaintiff's, the plaintiff's bar is something like intellectually dishonest because they don't look at reforming themselves. Um, I thought that was really interesting, and I wanted to hear uh, your opinion on what reforms you think would be necessary. You know what, and, I, and let, let's address that one first, and I'll ask you about the, other, the others after. Yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the few uh, plaintiff's attorneys who actually likes and respects Ted Frank. I think that, that uh, the plaintiff's bar misunderstands his role. Uh, he, is, he is one of our greatest allies, whether he wants to be or not. Um, he is one of our greatest allies because he is fighting to make sure that settlements are better for the class. He really is. He's not looking to, to extort money in, uh, in class action objections like the professional uh, objector bar is. He's saying, let's make sure that we have non-reversionary funds. Let's make sure money isn't going to Cypre, but is really going to people. Let's make sure notice is good. All of those things mean that when we are in the, the, the mediation, we're able to say to the defendant, look, look at how much the law has changed. When we're sitting here and saying we need a better settlement, now there's, there's a lot of support out there for it, you know, because it used to be that, that the big response was, we don't want to do your settlement because we don't have to because all these other plans firms are putting together worse deals and we want one of those. And then, you know, our response was, well, well we see ourselves differently and, and we're going to demand something better. It, no one liked that argument. It's an easier argument to say, you know, the, uh, you know Ted Frank's going to come in and blow up the deal. Let, let's actually just follow the law and make sure it's a good deal for the class. Um, and, and that's been a lot more effective. So I, I think he's had a huge, huge impact positively uh, on the plaintiff's, uh, on, in the plaintiff's bar. It's an interesting perspective. I, I certainly grant you that. I, well, let me ask you, have you, have you, has he objected to any of your settlements? He has, um, he has definitely inquired about some of our settlements and, and we've had uh, differences of opinion. Um, the, you know, the, the and I, I want to be clear. I'm, you know, not I'm not an ally of, of, of Ted Frank, and sure. he, I, you know, I'm not endorsing every argument he makes, and and he certainly isn't, I'm sure, endorsing anything I do. Right. Uh, but um, but he is someone who uh, who's a smart guy who uh, understands the law, is trying to push the law in a lot of ways. That the plaintiffs bar is trying to push the law. I mean, different ways, but that's his view: is find a vehicle and try to push the law in a way that he thinks makes sense. Because of that, you can have real discussions with them, um, you know, and explain here's the actual results, and that stuff moves them. Right. You know, when you say, "Let me explain what the claims rate is," right. that actually matters to them. That's interesting. I, I hadn't heard that, so that's really interesting to me. Well, yeah, he told me that. I, I think, and I don't mean to speak for him, but right. he, you know, he he suggested to me that I was, you know, the first 
plaintiff's attorney who actually you know, picked up the phone and called them and said, you want information? We'll give you information. Right. We, we believe in the settlement and, um, and uh, you know, we, we want you to understand that. That's great. That's interesting. Listen, listen it's food for thought, certainly. And I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of plaintiff's attorneys are going to be both surprised and interested in that response. Um, the other sort of thing that surprised me that I saw recently in the press with regards to you, is, and because you're seen as someone who is antithetical to the tech companies, so to speak, was you recently penned an editorial, right, in support of Apple's position with regard to the, uh, the FBI opening the iPhone. And I just wanted to give you the forum to discuss that. Yeah, the uh, you know Apple is is one of the better companies when it comes to privacy, and the reason for that is because unlike Facebook, for example, they actually sell real products. Facebook, they're in the business of just getting as much data from you as possible and then monetizing it. So it allows Apple to have slightly different stances. Uh, I think that they're exactly right in trying to make sure that that uh, their system is as secure as possible. And I think the government is making such a big mistake in trying to suggest that companies need to have back doors. I think it's a national security threat. Uh, you look, you know, at the ransomware going on in hospitals, um, where uh, you know the things that hackers can do uh, with driverless cars that are going to happen. Drones in Israel were recently hacked into. Um, it's it the the government should be pushing. Uh, private industry to make things as secure as possible. The fact that, that they were having the opposite view was very disturbing. Now, we don't, we don't think, we think one of the big problems with the debate is that uh, Apple was the spokesperson and they have different interests. You know, their interests were business interests and their opinions on First Amendment uh, grounds and um, we would love it if the government actually got to a point where they let consumers have a voice instead of just listening to Silicon Valley. Uh, for for all of their all the insight into privacy, Silicon Valley being the people who help get them elected, they sure. tend to have a much bigger voice. Does the CFPB or any any other governmental arm give consumers, in your opinion, that voice you're hoping they have, or could it? So I I think that the um, the FTC has been uh, terrific when it comes to privacy. Um, they, they have a similar approach that, that we do. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not trying to, to suggest that they endorse our approach, but we endorse their approach. And um, they, their view seems to be a few things. One is talk very openly and honestly and transparently about what you're seeing and tell the defendants before suit what to do to prevent suits. That's what we think we're in the business of. Okay. We've got plenty of lawsuits to bring. We want people to follow the law. The FTC seems to have that view too. But they're also very aggressive if that's not happening. They're willing to push the law uh, to, to hold companies accountable and they've gotten some terrific results. Uh, but that's not across the board. I think the FTC is, is you know, one of the few exceptions. FC, F, the FCC is getting more and more involved too. Some state AGs, Connecticut uh, AG is, is terrific, California. And those states, are ju they're just more out in front of the curve in terms of enforcing privacy regulations? Yeah. Okay, that's great. So Jay, I wouldn't be doing my job. The readers would all be very upset. The viewers would all be very upset if we didn't talk about Spokio. Okay. Um, at, at the time of this filming, and this could change tomorrow morning, we still don't know what's going to happen with the Supreme Court. I'm obviously very interested in your prediction, but I think I'd also like to hear a little bit about how you felt going into the argument um, and whether there was ever an idea to, to not move forward on Spokio or if that was even procedurally pos possible because I know that people had discussed that at different conferences and I've been privy to it and I just would like, you know, I, I want to hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Yeah, I've never gotten more pressure from the plaintiff's bar in my life uh, uh, to drop the Spokio case um, before, uh, which, um, which uh, I definitely listen to. I will listen to, to anybody. Uh, and so we had you know, a dozen meetings with people who all had the same thing, please drop this. Uh, it, it's actually not clear that, that you can uh, after, uh, after cert is, is granted. Um, but we, again, we have a little bit of a different take on the case. One is we thought it was a really good vehicle. There was no question that the Supreme Court was going to be taking up this issue. At some point, they'd already done Edwards. Um, they were they were very eager to do it. 
Um, and we felt very good about, about the facts and about the types of arguments we could make. Um, and um, so we, th we thought that, that we had kind of the best chance before the court. Plus, we also have a different view about what a loss means. I think, I think everybody misunderstands what Spokio is about. They think that the question is whether you're allowed to bring suits uh, for statutory damages in the absence of, of what the defense bar is calling concrete harm. Right. That's not what the case is about. It's about whether you're allowed to bring suits in federal court under Article 3. One of the, the biggest kind of ironies is the defense bar spent the last 15 years trying to get class actions federalized so that they're in forms of their choice. Um, and if they win in Spokio, then we're back to state court. There, a lot of the state courts follow the same Article 3 jurisprudence as, as the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court does, but a lot don't. About a dozen don't, including California. Um, so our view is that that like a lot of the, um, of the supposed defense wins, uh, a, a defense win in Spokio probably would end up helping the plaintiff's bar in a lot of ways. Now, that being said, we still wanted to win because we like the law as it is, and sure. there's always uncertainty when things change. But let's talk about that for a minute. And maybe I'll be showing my own ignorance. I haven't practiced in a, little, in a couple of years. But what I don't understand is if you, obviously they wanted everyone in federal court, right? That goes without saying there was a concerted effort to make that happen. Right. But if you go back on a case like that, back in the state court, can't they try to remove it and then, and then say that there's no, th there's no jurisdiction because if Spokio goes the wrong way, does it become a circle, I guess is what I'm asking? Yeah, so that, that I, I think you're exactly right. That, that would be their best argument, which is that the cases are in perpetual purgatory, yeah. where they, they remove it, um, and, then, um, and then you get it remanded, and then they remove it again. Uh, we think that, that is, uh, that's actually sanctionable behavior if they do that. But, that, but that, is, that is an open question, and it's certainly an argument that they would make. I mean, if, if we think about it, that is uh, a pretty crazy argument that- um, I've heard crazier. You have, you have. Um, and, um, but at, at this point, you know, I, I think that there's probably less uh, less concern about that. We felt very good at oral argument, and um, and you know it's taken a while to get the decision, uh, but we we feel we feel okay. Obviously, we've in the interim seen the death of Justice Scalia. Um, do you think that is going to be the, the gravamen of how it ultimately gets decided? So. We, we actually thought we, we had a chance uh, of getting Justice Scalia on our side. Um, he was, uh, that, that was part of our strategy. We thought seven justices were in play. Uh, everybody else thought that we should, we should uh, target Kennedy and then the four liberals, but, right. which we of course did, but we thought that, that there were two other justices in play as well. Uh, and Scalia was one of them. He was incredibly aggressive at oral argument, um, which we actually, uh, understood could be a decent sign. Sometimes he does that when he, he, he vents um, and um, uh, when he realizes that, you know, you're right and you've got it, he's got a rule for you. So, um, so I, I, I don't know what the impact um, is. Um, you know, at this point, it's probably more likely that, that it's sitting at 4-4 now and that they're trying to come to some sort of consensus. The New York Times suggested, uh, quoted Justice Kagan recently, uh, and suggested that they, they're trying to avoid 4-4 four, four ties. If that happens, then you know, we're expecting some sort of narrow ruling. Right. Uh, I think that's where it might have been heading anyways after, after oral argument. Jay, that was fascinating. I'm so glad you were able to join us, and I think this is uh, one of the best leading litigators yet, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun.